بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أيها الحضور الكرام نرحب بكم في منتدى الابتكار العالمي في دورته السادسة والمنظم من قبل الاتحاد العالمي لمجالس التنافسية والهيئة العامة للاستثمار والمقام في مدينة الملك عبد الله الاقتصادية Ladies and gentlemen السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It's my pleasure to welcome you to King Abdullah Economic City for the 2015 Global Innovation Summit and annual meeting of the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils. We are delighted to have here with us leading thinkers from business, government, and civil society. Over the next two days, we will have a variety of panels, discussions, and workshops on competitiveness and infrastructure. We know your time is valuable, and we greatly appreciate you spending it with us. Once again, welcome to Saudi Arabia. Hope you enjoy your time. And now, please allow me to introduce the Governor and Chairman of the Board of Directors of, Saudi, of the Saudi Arabian General Investment Authority, His Excellency, Governor Abdul Latif Al Uthman. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وصبحكم الله بالخير وحياكم الله في مدينة الملك عبد الله الاقتصادية Your Royal Highnesses, Your Excellencies, Honored Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen A very good morning to all of you And a very warm welcome to all of you at King عبد الله Economic City and to those of you who are here for the first time uh, to Saudi Arabia. And I, I want to welcome all of you to the 2015 annual meeting of the Global Federation of Competitiveness Council and the Global Innovation Summit. And before I begin, I would like to uh, take this opportunity and uh, thank uh, all of our uh, sponsors and organizers for bringing about this event. And a special thank also uh, to the Honorable uh, Deborah uh, Smith, uh, as well as all of the GFCC for all the work that you have done to enhance the discussion surrounding competitiveness as the nature of the global business continues uh, to evolve. Working together to promote greater innovation, sustainability, and reliance among nations is a crucial part of encouraging global competitiveness, growth, and stability. For five years, the GFCC has provided the platform for this cooperation to take place, and we expect that you will continue to do that and work with Saudi Arabia and the region to enhance our competitiveness as we turn, in turn continue to enhance our economic fitness to meet the challenges of the future, and as we go beyond the basic understanding of competitiveness, of looking at policies and regulations and enhancing the ease of doing business, which is a must and essential, but not sufficient. More importantly, as we work together on a new generation of economic sectors, a new generation of investments that will help diversify the economy of this region that has been endowed with natural resources, but yet is in dire need of economic diversification and to be put on a trajectory of sustainable uh, development. Greater competitiveness, however, is an agenda that is not exclusive to the GCC. Uh, remaining ahead of the curve in the age we live in requires a fresh thinking from leaders in government and businesses alike across the globe. Traditional barriers to do business have been brought down by globalization. Companies are no longer restricted by a geographical location while simultaneously a generation of entrepreneurs is driving global innovation through new companies that create or harness cutting-edge technologies. <laughs> Governments around the world are looking to capture both of these elements, established companies looking to invest in new markets and promising young businesses that will provide the world with the industries of tomorrow. Saudi Arabia, too, has recognized this. Since our accession to the WTA in 2005, 
increasing our competitiveness to attract new generation of investments to diversify our economy has truly become a national effort and a priority. In fact, we are sitting in one of the physical embodiments, uh, embodiments of the ongoing transformation happening in the kingdom right now, the King Abdullah economic city itself. Cake hosts the King Abdullah port, which is poised to become a regional and a global hub for shipping and trade. On the other side of the city rests the Haramain station, one of four stops on our planned high-speed rail network and a second important transportation link for companies that are looking to do business on the Arabian Peninsula. Al Haramain station, just by having a station, will create a whole new economic activity in the city, offering unique services for people who not only want to do business, but also those who come to visit Saudi Arabia to perform some of the religious activities in the country. Encircling the port is Cake Industrial Valley. With its proximity to King Abdullah Port and its attractive incentives, a number of world leading companies have already chosen to set up operation in the valley and we're seeing an exponential increase in interest by many leading companies to look at King Abdullah Economic City and what it has to offer as a place of choice. While you are here, I would invite you to go on a tour and visit Cake to see all that it has to offer. But I would also invite you to consider the fact that this is just one step in a journey Saudi Arabia is on towards a greater competitiveness and economic diversity. Our approach is multifaceted, but broadly we are working across four fronts. First, we have renewed our commitment to maintaining leadership and ease of doing business. As many of you know, much has been done in the past five years to improve the kingdom's business environment. Granted, some initiatives are taking longer than we wanted to be introduced and implemented, but recently we have completed an in-depth, intrusive, and introspective look into what can be done to take Saudi Arabia to the next level. In this regard, I am pleased to indicate that important decisions and announcements will be made very soon to signal the global business community that Saudi Arabia is not only open for business, but really a destination of choice for many investors, and those reforms will be announced very soon because they've been in the works for uh, several years and they're about to reach to the fruition uh, stage. Second, although we maintain a very strong <clears throat> financial position with deep reserves and almost no debt, we recognize the need and the benefits of diversifying our economy away from oil. This particular endeavor will offer unique and new investment opportunities for the private sector. Our efforts in diversification is a great opportunity for the astute private sectors, both local and international, to recognize that such a transformation would have the private sector as a centerpiece of all this effort that will be taking place. This is a developing success story that we all want those with the wherewithal to be a part of. Through national initiatives, we are targeting a number of sectors where we believe Saudi Arabia has a great deal to offer investors, whether it be through attractive in incentives or investment opportunities. And here I want to highlight this, that to go back to my first remark on that ease of doing business is essential and a, necessary, a necessity, but not sufficient. Countries who are deliberate on where they want to go will achieve what they want. Countries who don't know where they want to be will go nowhere. And that's why Saudi Arabia is focusing on key sectors to position itself to achieve excellence, regional prominence, and global success. And that is through an initiative that we are working on, which is called National Unified Investment Plan, where we are working with key sectors to identify investment opportunities, leveraging 
some of the government to spend, leveraging some of the competitive advantages that we have, but really to integrate investments across the value chains in these target sectors. I, I believe in the program today, my colleague Mishari will be talking about the effort that we're doing. It's a beginning of a journey, but it's clear to me and to all of us in Saudi Arabia that we have to be deliberate and diligent about the diversification. Without that, we will, we will not achieve our ambitions. <clears throat> the Unified Investment Plan uh, has already identified $140 billion worth of investments in the transport and healthcare sectors uh, and, uh, that, that are available during the next uh, 10 years. And uh, the information is actually being made available uh, to all of you. You can download it on, uh, through the App Store on your iPhone and uh, Android. Third, uh, we want our competitiveness to be measured not only by the opportunities and the incentives we offer, and this is really important, but it is through a clear commitment to our customers, through actions that we take for their sake and on their behalf, and to foster that relationship to a new level, a more of a strategic level with the investors in Saudi Arabia, both the local and the international offering a superior and differentiated service to investors and potential investors alike uh, has therefore become a priority for us. To accomplish this, we have simplified the process to get an investment license. Nearly all of it can now be completed online. And where previously you would require about 12 documents to apply for a license, by January you will do this all online using only three documents, and that will be all introduced uh, beginning of the year. This has been done along, alongside significant improvements in the, dime, in the time it takes to receive the license, applications from reception for, of, of, of the application to the decision to issue the license now uh, takes less than five working days, and if you go and visit our website on average service time, you will see how we are uh, maintaining that uh, quite uh, impressive uh, track record. This, of course, is the, is the type of high quality administrative services that we want to provide. And actually, we want it to free us uh, so we can move on uh, to a more strategic relationship that I, talk about, uh, I talked about. We want the relationship with the investors to be deeper and much more uh, strategic in nature, working closely with our partners to understand their needs and help them fulfill their obligation is another part of the services that we're looking uh, to provide. Uh, comprehensive targeted relationship management with executives and boards will be the next step we take. We've already attempted to do that. And I urge uh, all of you who are coming from uh, investment promotion uh, agencies to really invest in that uh, and move away from the transactional relationship into the strategic relationship with your investor and see how you can help them grow their businesses, what barriers they are uh, facing, uh, and, and how you, you can expand that. Research has shown that 80% of incremental FDI comes in from brownfield investments. So pay attention to the new potential prospective investors, but equally, and maybe even more important, don't lose sight of your already customers who have chosen uh, to be here uh, with you. And that is a priority for, uh, for, for us, and this is where we are uh, focusing on. Finally, we're promoting innovation and enhancing the entrepreneurial culture within the kingdom. Like uh, in many sectors, we are building pockets of competitiveness for R&D to make Saudi Arabia a regional and a global hub for innovation. While at CAKE, we're not uh, too far away from King Abdullah University of Science and Technology that has quickly become world-renowned global uh, center for research, and I believe that we will have some representation uh, from KAUST. If it is not already here uh, on the panel, you will uh, get a chance to uh, uh, hear uh, some of the exciting work that they're doing. Uh, but uh, the students at KAUST are taking the next step by turning the insights from their work into exciting business and industries of tomorrow. 
The university has created over 30 spin-off companies, many of which have achieved major scientific advances, for example, in desalination and the renewable uh, energies, but also in the desert agriculture uh, plantation, uh, which is uh, something that is uh, of crucial importance to us uh, here. And uh, we in, in Sagia, as well as EEC, uh, are working with KAUST uh, to help create set of regulations that will accelerate the commercialization of uh, such ventures. This is uh, partly a testament of the fact that uh, we're making it easier for cutting edge homegrown enterprises and foreign SMEs to grow and thrive in Saudi Arabia. Finding the right competitive mix of regulation and incentives for SMEs is always an ongoing process for the country. And recently there has been an announcement on the creation of an agency dedicated for uh, looking after the SMEs and we look forward uh, to work with them. Uh, but SMEs in the kingdom already have uh, access to hundreds of millions of dollars in public funding, support services, and a licensing procedure tailored specifically to them. For foreign SMEs, we have refined and aligned our visa requirements to make it easier for small businesses to come to Saudi Arabia. We even went the extra mile where we will provide visa for anybody who wants to come to Saudi Arabia to explore business opportunities in Saudi uh, Arabia. So whether you're a large multinational or a small business, there are a number of other aspects about investments in Saudi Arabia worth noting. Our economy has a strong position and is still growing. We have a domestic market of 31 million people with significant purchase power. Your quick and easy access to this large and growing domestic market will give you a foothold that allows expansion across the region and further afield. There are very few countries in the world that tell you, come, invest, we have the market and the growth, but we also have the regional potential for you to grow. Many tell you, come, we have services, but a plan on exporting. Or others say, come, we have the market, but you're vulnerable to only our market volatility. We are in the unique position where we offer you both of them. You can come, benefit from the market, but also use it as a platform to expand further. Our strategic location serves as a gateway to businesses in the rest of the Middle East, Africa, and other parts of the world. And finally, the Saudi Arabian government is fully committed to diversification strategy, which, as I mentioned, is a commitment to enable the private sector to thrive and succeed. Our regu regulatory, fiscal, and financial policies all view diversification and private sector growth as national objectives, meaning you will have the encouragement and the support of the kingdom behind you and behind your investment. No, nowhere else you can find the market size, location, and the government commitment to help you achieve your aim. Other key aspects of the, businesses and of the business environment that we have, and I say that for, probably it's a repeat for uh, some of you, but it's for the benefit who are here for the first time, we allow 100% foreign ownership in most sectors. And you will be hard pressed to find that in many, many countries. Wholesale and retail in particular can now own 100% of their businesses, where previously it was uh, allowed up to 75%. No personal income tax, no value added tax, no sales tax, and a very low and fixed corporate tax rate. And full re repatriation of capital, profit, and dividend is allowed. We are also changing our investment law that will allow strategic investors after their first year an extension of their license period of, of up to 15 years. Telling you about how we are generate, uh, gearing regulations and incentives to increase our competitiveness is of course an enjoyable part of our job. But it's not the most exciting. What is most exciting is that we have an untraditional competitive advantage that many don't. The kingdom offers individuals and entrepreneurs and corporate executives the unique opportunity to be part of a story larger than just regulatory and policy changes. 
It is about a transformation of a nation that is taking place, that is unfolding behind and before the, uh, our eyes. It's an opportunity for people to be challenged, to stretch their imagination and their capabilities, whether they are professionals, executives, or corporates. You can come to Saudi Arabia and be involved in probably one of the first in many things, whether it's on the professional level or on the mega project levels. You will find that you can write in your CV or in your history that I have been part of a once in a lifetime transformation, whether it is technical or entrepreneurial or a business venture. And I think this is a unique opportunity that those of, of, of us who thrive on making an impact will find it to be very rewarding. Up to this point, the real story of Saudi Arabia has been largely left untold. But every day a new page is being turned on a beautiful tale that will continue to unfold as the years go by. And we are inviting you to be part of that story and maybe even help write it. You will become part of and discover the rich cultural fabric of a nation that is becoming increasingly diverse with each generation. You will be part of a community that is and will continue to be a greater place to raise children and to raise family and to forge diver diversified culture. And you will be part and at the forefront of our diversification push, allowing you to become a key player in a growing, lively, and dynamic business environment geared towards commercial success. This is Saudi Arabia competitive landscape and this is Saudi Arabia story, and we invite you to be part of that story. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. And now it's my pleasure to invite to stage the Honorable Deborah Wentz Smith, President of the Global Federation of Competitiveness Council. Good morning. It's my great pleasure and honor to be in King Abdullah Economic City for the sixth annual meeting of the Global Competitiveness Councils and the Innovation Summit on 21st Century Infrastructure. First, allow me, on behalf of the GFCC and our distinguished board members and guests, to offer our collective thanks and great appreciation to His Excellency Abdullah Latif Al Othman, the Governor of the Saudi Arabian Investment Authority, for both his leadership and gracious hospitality, hospitality in hosting the GFCC community of competitiveness leaders and innovators gathered here in King Abdullah Economic City, clearly a 21st century innovation city of the future, a city that is rising before our very eyes a city that will anchor and catalyze a new era of innovation-driven economic growth, inclusive prosperity in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and in the extended dynamic Red Sea region and the world at large, accelerating the integration of complex global supply chains, the emergence of advanced manufacturing capabilities, and nurturing, very importantly, the knowledge-based new industries of the future that, tend, that depend upon the talent, the ingenuity, and the commitment of people working in the frontiers of innovation. Clearly, we're going to see over the next years unparalleled opportunities for high-skilled value investment and the high-value growth of work and creation of new economic activity here in King Abdullah Economic City, in Saudi Arabia, the wider region, and of course, the world in which we all live and operate today. The governor really outlined for us a very visionary strategy for Saudi Arabia's next stage of not just development, but creating a new world in which we will all participate, one in which the innovation 
friendly environment for business is going to be not only given the highest priority, it will become the platform on which to build, again, the high value in which we all strive to compete and prosper and add the stability and security of life for all our people. And this is very, very important in a world of highly contested global markets. Clearly, King Abdullah Economic City, in my view, constitutes the jewel in the crown, really the capstone of the vision and enduring commitment and leadership of his former majesty, King Abdullah, who imagined and designed and built with really a unique private-public business model, the city of the future. Some of you may not know, and we'll have the chance to hear this over the next few days, that the actual business model for how to bring to life a city on this scale and scope is in of itself an innovation um, success that we all should look at and emulate as we look at other opportunities for 21st century infrastructure in our own nations. King Abdullah Economic City is going to be, as we heard, powered by one of the world's top 10 ports. It's going to be powered by an educated and creative workforce. Yes, anchored in such world-class universities such as KAUST. I'm very proud that the president of KAUST, Dr. John Luchemeau, um, who's the former president of Caltech, was a very active member of the board of the Council on Competitiveness and actually was one of the founding university leaders in our groundbreaking National Innovation Initiative that was launched over uh, 12 years ago in the United States that has led to our national focus and commitment to innovation as being the only sustainable driver for just yes, the diversification of our economy but very importantly, for productivity and for high value creation. Governor Al Ahmed, the GFCC community congratulates you, your very talented staff that we've had the honor to work with, and the whole team at SAGIA for bringing us here to King Abdul Economic City, and also to really see the progress that has occurred in the 10 by 10 competitiveness strategy that Saudi Arabia released some years ago that many of around the world have looked at, have emulated, and are seeing the tangible progress today. And we also congratulate you for your leadership in designing the Saudi United Investment Plan, which you described to us um, this morning as well. We're very excited that today also at the GFCC, we will have the first um, release of the new Corporate Governance Index. I'd also like to formally thank and congratulate the 2015 Vice Chairman of the GFCC, His Royal Highness Prince Saad Al Faisal, who's the Executive Director of Investment Policy and Regulations at SAGIA, for his inspired leadership and commitment to the future economic competitiveness of his nation and region, but very importantly for his understanding of the power and the potential of the GFCC network. Prince Saud, you're truly a global champion of competitive strategy, but very importantly, of competitiveness action. At the end of the day, strategy without action and implementation really becomes just ideas. We're going to see actions that will drive, yes, productivity, growth, and prosperity for years to come. And let me also welcome all of the members of the GFCC network who've traveled from all over the world to be with us today. And I want to thank each and every one of you for all the work you do back in your own countries to make your nations more competitive, more innovative, more prosperous. But you all recognize something that's very important, and that is the purpose and the power and the potential of collaboration and co-creation at the frontiers of, yes, competitiveness thought leadership, but very importantly, competitiveness implementation. You all recognize by bringing together our respective realities, our respective opportunities, our respective challenges, we can forge together a new global movement to put competitiveness strategy and action at the very heart of global economic decision making social and economic investment, the critical economic reforms that are needed around the world, 
and also as a way to underpin the complex change that's required to prosper in a world undergoing tremendous turbulence, transition, and transformation. Together, we all understand and embrace and are committed to the power of partnerships, the power of collaboration to forge a better world of opportunity for our own citizens, the next generation, and the world at large. We are meeting here at CAUS at a time of great challenges in the world. I've used the words transition, turbulence, transformation, and they're very purposeful worlds because this is an unsettling time in nations and regions in the world at large. Just think about it, since the great global recession of 2008 to 2009, global productivity is still stagnant. Global growth is anemic, if not flatlined. We're seeing nations where, global, where their growth is actually going below levels that would have been unheard of or unthought of 10 years ago. In spite of a 20th century track record of ever-increasing trade liberalization and opening of new markets that have lifted billions out of poverty, trade growth, the circulatory lifeblood of the global economy, is weaker than at any time in the last two decades. Who would have ever thought that? Indeed, we see the juxtaposition of the emergence of regional trading blocks coupled to an increasing political perception and actions in both the developed and emerging world that trade openness, trade integration, trade expansion, the movement and flow of people's ideas, goods and services in ever complex value chains circulating the globe is perhaps not developing the promise of jobs, of rising standards of living and inclusive prosperity. We're cert certainly seeing that narrative in the United States playing out in our national pre presidential election now underway. This ambivalence to the global trading system with the emergence of ever more complex interconnected global problems calls for a renewed focus on consensus and a focus on how we're going to achieve concerted action. Look at the challenges we're dealing with, yes, in our nations, but on a global, unprecedented scale. From affordable energy access and the electrification of the world, the need to not just double food production, but triple food production by 2050. The emergence of water scarcity, accompanied with the rising drought conditions from climate change, becoming a national security issue as well as an economic issue. We're seeing polarized demographics from rapidly aging societies to societies with rapidly growing, underemployed, unemployed youth, many of whom are moving into major mega cities. We're seeing the imperative of addressing global health pandemics while at the same time providing access to affordable health to the majority of people that live in our world. We're seeing the greatest human mass migration since the early 20th century, and the list goes on and on. Indeed, we are living in the midst of a perfect storm, and a storm that calls for a new era, a new imperative, a new compact for public-private decision makers and action leaders that transcend nations and borders, and this is why the global competitiveness agenda has to be elevated to the highest tier of decision making and at the agenda of every nation in the world. And this is why the GFCC movement, as I like to call it, of thinkers, of creators, but very importantly, of policy decision makers and doers, we all have a responsibility that is more important than ever to bridge this gap we are the ones who can connect the dots and catalyze momentum to a new sustainable future. Now, as we stand at the threshold of the 21st century, we are both blessed and challenged to live in such extraordinary times in the continuum of human progress and civilization. Make mo no mistake, the 20th century models of production and services are gone. They will never return. The most important resources for production are knowledge, technology, capital, and skills, all highly mobile, 
highly interconnected, and highly disrupted. All economies use digital networks to access the world's businesses, supply chains, markets, and jobs. So it is easy to say that everyone everywhere is competing for everything all the time. The ability to manufacture high-tech goods and provide high-tech services has become widely diffused and has upset traditional concepts and realities of what comparative advantage actually means. The swelling global labor pool has created unprecedented competition for the world's work. And in fact, every day it's easier to ship that world around the world in bits and bytes. For the first time in human history, we have real-time 24-7 global labor arbitrage. And with both advanced nations and emerging nations realizing that it is a race to the bottom to develop a strategy, a competitiveness strategy, that is anyway based on capitalizing on a low-wage, low-innovation platform. And today, we have a multipolar science and technology world where game-changing technologies and innovation is originating and erupting everywhere. Overnight, we're seeing disruptive supply chains, we're seeing obsolete jobs, and we're seeing the reordering of markets. These complex disruptive shifts in the global economic landscape are also occurring at another unique time in human history. We are living in a new age of unprecedented knowledge, technological power, that is just unfolding before our eyes, as we are living right now in the convergence and collision of four major scientific revolutions that are all coming together. The digital, the biotechnology, the nanotechnology, the cognitive revolutions, they are rewriting the rules of production and services in digital code, in genetic code, atomic code, and neural code in ways that we could only imagine a decade, decade ago. And quite frankly, not only will they pose profound change, but it will be those nations and those people who can capture the understanding and potential value creation that will see unprecedented prosperity come into their worlds. Nanotechnology. We've heard about it for years. If you go almost any place around the world and talk to policymakers, they say, we're going to be a leader in nanotechnology. But guess what? Nanotechnology is no longer coming of age. It's here. It's already reached the $1 trillion milestone. We've moved beyond the inflection point in biotechnology. The cost of DNA sequencing has just fallen through the floor. Cost reductions there have changed everything in biotech. But now with advanced genomics that's moving into agriculture and, of course, in human health with advanced genomics, we're already living in a world of personalized medicine. We're eradicating the potential for disease. And there's even, perhaps on a dark side, the emergence of human augmentation enabled by genomics and the biotech revolution. The physical world and the virtual world, again, are converging and colliding across numerous dimensions through sensors and networks and data. We are actually drowning in a tsunami of data. Every human activity that can be measured is being quantitatively characterized. And we're connecting people on a scale once unimaginable. We all are talking about the Internet of Things. But guess what? The Internet of Things is obsolete. It is the Internet of everything, as it stretches across a multitude of human endeavors. This unfolding of interplay between bits and atoms has profound implications for manufacturing, for innovation, for economic diversification, huge opportunity, and of course, ultimately, for the productivity and growth that enables productivity. And yes, profoundly for national security. For as our interconnected, cyber-enabled world expands, every day we are all facing relentless cyber attacks to cyber-enabled critical infrastructure, as well as cyber attacks that are accessing the intellectual property and knowledge in proprietary businesses, as well as in governments. This is a disruption, and it's one that enables the dark side of the transformation, and it's one that we have to come together to figure out new rules of the game, because cyber-enabled world is at the heart of competitiveness. I want to give a few examples of disruption occurring at such an unprecedented pace that policymakers really, one, they don't often understand it and they don't have time to act. And that's, the, I'll give the U.S. example. 
Five years ago, the United States lived in a world of energy scarcity. We were concerned that our manufacturing was no longer viable. In fact, some of us may remember the language, and I was part of this many years as a senior U.S. government official, when we thought that manufacturing was dirty, dumb, dis disappearing, and dangerous. But guess what? Today, manufacturing is smart, it's safe, it's sustainable, and it's surging. And you couple that with the ener energy revolution in the United States, yes, our shale gas revolution that gives us unbounded resources to transform many of our basic industries, including chemicals, but in parallel with the clean energy revolution moving to a non-carbon world, this is a perfect storm for very, very high value innovation. And so in the US, we're seeing a huge manufacturing renaissance. And that renaissance has the potential to be everywhere in the world, and I would certainly say in King Abdullah Economic City. With advanced materials, with sensors, with high performance computing, modeling, and simulation, Yes, we will see humanless factories, but we're going to see an extended system that requires tremendous knowledge, tremendous skills, and we have to all together be training our workforce to be able to prosper and thrive in this new world of 21st century manufacturing. We also have now the second innovation revolution underway. And this is a very important transformation that I just want to briefly share with you. Because new innovation ecosystems have emerged outside the traditional systems and the traditional institutions of research and, and innovation in universities and labs and in corporations. Open innovation platforms are providing places and processes that are now connecting innovation seekers with problem solvers, and they're offering limitless ways for people to get involved in the innovation enterprise of the world. We're seeing the democratization of financing for innovation embodied in global web-based crowdsourcing sites such as Kickstarter, Equinet, and Crowdfunder. Just one statistic, in 2009, 9.6 million people have backed a Kickstarter project. But already now, 2 billion has pledged, and there are 93 projects underway. This is disruption, again, on a massive scale. An example. A tiny startup company many of us have not heard of called Oculus VR used Kickstarter to raise $2.4 million from 10,000 people to fund the development of their virtual reality. Head Facebook recently, recently acquired Oculus for $2 billion. And guess what? Facebook would not hire the two innovators who applied for jobs. Innovation disruption coming from individuals who had imagination, who had energy, and were accessing the power and potential of these new models outside of traditional networks. Another one is the uh, renter a code activity. Again, two young, brassy innovators, they, they said, we're going to take on instant messaging. And what did they come up with? They just invested $250,000 to launch WhatsApp. They now have over a billion users globally. Again, acquired last year by Facebook for $20 billion, but Facebook refused to hire those two innovators when they applied for jobs. These are very, very sobering examples of the power and potential of the new second revolution of innovation. And so as policymakers, as competitiveness leaders, we have to ensure that we are setting the infrastructure, the policies, the environment that enables that while at the same time ensuring that our large-scale global enterprises can prosper and thrive in an ever-changing world. Another example I will share, the whole movement now to, yes, 3D printing and making things in a, in a factorless environment where you can press a button and an end product will come out. In less than eight months, a new startup company in the United States, Loco Motors, for entrepreneurs, one of whom happened to be a retired Marine officer. They developed with Oak Ridge, with innovators around the world, designers in Italy, the first ever 3D printed composite electric vehicle. And these innovators say that Tesla is the last gap of the 20th century auto model. They're going to be printing drones on the battlefield and printing drones in backyards. This is disruptive, it's transformational, and 
leaders in the Global Competitiveness Council and policy, we have to be prepared to enable this and respond to it so that it creates value and not disruption that hurts our societies and undercuts the ability for global prosperity. We all have a chance to become innovators. And again, let me turn to the importance of the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils. Why are we together? Well, one, we want to understand and do something about the emerging challenges of competitiveness. We want to generate new policy ideas and concepts that will shape the debate in our own nations and globally. We want to be at the forefront of forging the public and private partnerships that are essential to take us into a new future. And we want to galvanize all the stakeholders, stakeholders in leadership networks to translate policy into sustainable action for reform and change. I had the opportunity yesterday to visit one of the great centers of human civilization here in Saudi Arabia, in Madam Salai, one of the centers of the great Nabataean civilization, to see the engineering, to see the way they manage water, to see how they provided food. This was innovation on a scale almost 2,000 years ago that is inspirational for us as we move in to a new era of transition, yes, turbulence, but transformation that is going to take us to a world of abundance, not a world of scarcity, and in a world in which all of our children will have the opportunity to create, to dream, and have a wonderful standard of living. So with that, I want to thank all of you for being here, for sharing your ideas. We're going to have very dynamic sessions. At the end of the day, I want all of us to be here to have a very interactive session with Peter Myers, who's the CEO of Stand Up and Deliver. You will thank me at the end of the day that we encourage Peter to join us, because you will not be the same person leaving tonight after you've participated in creating the story telling of why competitiveness matters and why we need to work together to create a new world. Thank you so much. Thank you, Deborah. Before we begin the first session, I would like to take a moment to recognize and thank our sponsors for making this great, this great event possible. Our organizing sponsor, King Abdullah Economic City, our, goal, our global sponsor, Sabak, our national sponsors, Azmil, Baytour, and Hassan Abbas Sharabatli Foundation, our competitive sponsor, the Jeddah National Hospital, and our media sponsor, <clears throat> Eye of Riyadh. And now for a short word from our, from our global sponsor, Sabak, delivered on their behalf by Dr. Khalid Abdullah Al-Bahili, Sabak Director of, Co of Corporate Catalysis at CRI in Kaust. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullah. A very good morning to all of you. Um, honored guest, it's an, an honor for me to represent SAPIC at the global, at this global innovation summit and join so many knowledgeable and experienced corporate leaders, government officials, and heads of important research and academic institutions. SAPIC remarkable story of entrepreneurship and innovation began nearly 40 years ago when Saudi Arabia decided to enter the field of manufacturing petrochemicals made chiefly from natural gas and natural gas liquids. From a modest beginning, SABIC is today recognized as the third largest diversified chemical company in the world, with operation in more than 50 countries across the world and around 40,000 worldwide employees. It has been an exciting and challenging journey, for sure. To realize our present global standing, we, we took a series of steps over the years to become a global challenger, a new vision 
diversification of markets, innovation, constant transformation, strengthening, partnering, and talent management and acquisitions. We are now preparing for global leadership in the petrochemical industry with SABIC 2025 strategy, which embraces both growth and transformation. So we strive for continuous improvement to become best in class and sustain our world leading position. We have ambitious plans to expand our portfolio toward downstream mainly specialty products, to add competitive edge to our company and Saudi Arabia's growth strategy. Honored guests, SABIC is a key player in supporting the kingdom's economic diversity efforts. As many of you know, under its national industrial cluster program, Saudi Arabia is targeting key industrial sectors that have strong growth potential in the kingdom. This is in line with the government's efforts to drive economic diversification beyond oil. SABIC believes that it is important to participate in this ongoing campaign and communicate the significance of SABIC product line and where we believe opportunity exists for downstream engagement. <coughs> we have adopted a very strong approach towards supporting small and medium enterprises, SMEs, by providing adequate opportunities for their growth, their innovation, and material supplies, principally through our polymers and specialty portfolios. <clears throat> the SMEs, we believe, represent a fundamental part of our country's industrialization strategy and future. We have also participated with the Saudi Aramco and the public investment fund in establishing the Saudi Industrial Investment Company last year. This new company is tasked with attracting and developing investments into downstream industries in the kingdom, mainly in the maritime, automotives, power, water, and electrical equipment sectors. Honored guest, Sabic's growth, particularly over the past 10 years, has provided enormous opportunities for innovation and optimization through synergy, integration, and knowledge sharing. We believe a commitment to innovation is a driver for growth and excellence and will distinguish future market winners. This is why an important pillar in SABEX development strategy has been investing in innovative technologies. We are taking advantage of cutting edge technologies in creating new, new sources of competitive feedstock and energy that will allow the company to continue to build a sustainable business. In Saudi Arabia, SABIC has made a considerable investment in establishing technology and innovation facilities. Three of our 19 global technology and innovation centers are in the kingdom. Just last week, we signed a partnership agreement with 43 top global, regional, and local companies to collaborate with us in our Home of Innovation Initiative, which seeks to stimulate growth in Saudi Arabia downstream industry. The Sabic Plastic Application Development Center, Sabatic, which we launched in Enria two years ago, is yet another important step for Sabic to evolve further as an innovation-driven company. Besides being an important driver of economic growth within Saudi Arabia's efforts to become a knowledge-based economy. Sabatic's role will be to introduce innovative plastic solutions to Saudi Arabia's entrepreneurs delivering new applications for businesses. To help spur innovation in Saudi Arabia, Sabic has also instituted an annual innovation award for entrepreneurs in Saudi Arabia. The objectives of the innovation challenges are to develop the kingdom's innovative and technological capabilities attract new business projects, and position SABIC within the innovation market. In conclusion, I would like to emphasize that we at SABIC are committed to uphold the strong relationship between industry, government, 
and entrepreneurial enterprise, which is so crucial for achieving long-term success and driving growth in Saudi Arabia. Thank you very much.